Hello, welcome to Leftward Books and News Click. I've had the pleasure of speaking to Professor Ajaz Ahmed about different books by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. This episode is about Marx's terrific book, Civil War in France, 1871, a text Marx wrote right after the Paris Commune was defeated after 72 days on the 28th of May, 1871. Ajaz, welcome. Nice to have you again. Thank you very much. Glad to be back. Ajaz, why don't you start by putting the text in its context, Civil War in France, 1871, the Paris Commune has just been crushed, the carnage in Paris, Marx writes this text, you know, intended for the, in, the first international and so on. Could you put the text and the commune in context? Um, the, 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 yes, um, uh, it's, it's a rather large undertaking, but I'll try. Uh, this particular text, um, the Civil War in France, as we know, was a third address. To the, uh, to the First International. He had already given uh, two addresses uh, to the International as the Commune, as the war, uh, the, the Franco-Prussian war, Prussian war, and then uh, the, um, uh, so, so the events that led to the Commune are, have been covered by his earlier texts. So in that sense, it's a much more condensed text and, uh, and much more theoretical reflection on the commune rather than a narrative. Uh, Engels, of course, later on published all three lectures together under that title, um, which was a good thing to do because then, then you get um, um, I think first thing to do is to actually reflect the relationship of this with the text we, we talked about the last time, which is the 18th program. Um, and I actually think that this is a, this is a very interesting uh, sequential relation between the manifesto, the, the, the 18th Bromaire and the civil war in France. Uh, as uh, you know, the manifesto is written in expectation of the revolution of 1848, um, which breaks out just about the time the uh, manifesto is published. Uh, then Marx writes a number of uh, addresses and essays on the revolution, which um, the, which also Engels put together as a as a collection. Uh, and then the uh, 18th Brumaire, which is written immediately after the, the counter-revolution is completed with the coup d'etat of Louis Napoleon. Uh, so there is an expectation of revolution, there is a defeat of revolution. The connection between uh, the manifesto and and now what you have is a revolution of a very different order, which actually lasts for 72 days, in which the proletariat makes a revolution entirely of its own. Unlike the, the, the revolution of 1848, this one is made by the proletariat very self-consciously as a proletarian revolution. Um, as much against the so-called Republic led by Thiers as a defense of Paris against the foreign uh, power of Bismarck's troops and so on and so forth. Uh, and it, this is a revolution that actually lasts for 72 years. Um, I might sort of <laughs> just say that, you know, after uh, the uh, Bolshevik, um, uh, after, after the Bolshevik Revolution had lasted for 73 days, uh, Levin, Lenin was found dancing uh, outside the Winter Palace because the revolution had now lasted a day beyond the 
and in some ways thought of the Bolshevik Revolution as the completion uh, or redemption or whatever you want to call it of the um, Revolution of 1871. So now, um, because it is a revolution of the proletariat <coughs> with a certain kind of vision to which I'll come about, Marx is now much more interested in what was accomplished in during that. And this connection that I'm talking about, textual connection, you know, in, in, in uh, section three of the Paris Commune, as he turns to the actual beginning of the, of the, um, of the Commune, uh, he, there's just one sentence saying um, on such and such morning, Paris woke up to the cries of Viva la Commune. And then he writes a whole long passage, which is simply lifted from the, from the last section, section seven of the, of the, of the 18th program. It's a revised version um, of that. So there is an absolute connection in his own mind. Uh, and rightly so, I'll come to, to that, why, why that is. So now what I think the gist of it is, this particular text, is Marx's reflections. The gist of those reflections is that the withering of the state is identical to the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's one and the same thing. And how does this state wither away in a movement which is the creation of the dictatorship of the proletariat? How does the proletariat take hold, not, not, not take hold, he actually starts by saying you cannot take hold you have to destroy the, 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 the state, uh, which he had already said in, uh, at the end of the 18th Um And here he sees the materialization of that. Um, <clears throat> that I think is the, the crux of it um, for him. Um, now, again, very interestingly, you know, um, what you all, you know, the very phrase withering away of the state is something that Marx shared with classical anarchism. Um, and what you saw in, during the, 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 the during the commune, uh, as Engels was to actually say in the, in the much later in the late 1880s, that there was a complete sort of the, the, the followers of Blanqui, the anarchists, were actually the largest, numerically the largest. The pre presence of the international in the, um, uh, in the commune was not minor. Uh, estimates range between 50,000 to 200,000 members of the international. Now, the international was, of course, not. Uh, you know, tightly, you know, tight cadre party. It actually was, um, you, you know, you just have to fill up a form. You become a member of the international. Um, but in order to, uh, there was no incentive in, in doing that unless you actually believed in the program of the international. So what you're talking about is a, a great movement uh, which had its own uh, organizational structure and so on and so forth. Uh, so, um, so followers of Marx are actually very active in, in it. And I'll also come back to, to, to that. Um, so for Marx, actually, that is what the interest is. And he talks about the actual, the, what, what the commune actually did um, in terms of, for example, the um, the sort of restructuring of what would, in a 
in a state of the bourgeoisie would be the civil service, the bureaucracy, and so on and so forth, in which they institute equality of wages all across, whatever your, um, your job may be, your position may be, the equality of wages, the highest was like 6,000 francs or something, um, which at that time is not a great amount of money. Uh, <clears throat> the revocable, uh, everything by election, everything revocable. Um, the, the judiciary, the bourgeoisie is always talking about the independence of the judiciary. And the judiciary itself became an electoral office um, uh, open to recall, uh, etc. So there are those kinds of activities of the, you know, the creation of a, of a commune that was the opposite of the state. And which was, which, which in fact was destroying the Republic that the various uh, versions of the Republic that had been in, in France since Napoleon. Um, that whole state structure that the, the, the Republican, um, the Republican revolution against the monarchy had created. Uh, it was the most central, uh, France was the most centralized state in Europe after Napoleon. And to give an, an, a notion of um, an alternative to it, and not only just at the level of Paris, what was very interesting, <clears throat> you know, they actually um, <clears throat> marched what they call, call the flag of the Universal Republic. Uh, and and what their conception was, was that all of France will become a, a sort of network of communes, which will de themselves be the beginning of a world consisting of communes. So they were actually thinking of a, a certain universality of form of this dictatorship of the proletariat. So their thinking and, um, was actually far beyond what they were able to do in, the, in, the, in those 72 days. Now, Marx doesn't actually go into all the details of what they did. It's one, one address. But this, at the center is that uh, what the um, what a socialist non-state would look like the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. So that, 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 that I think is, is the central part. Um, there are other things that I want to say about it. Uh, you know, Marx quite rightly begins with uh, the war and then um, the rise of the Republic and so on, uh, or rather reconstitution of this fake Republic against the US, and then goes into the um, there's actually something much more complex. One more thing I'd say, and then I'll stop there and we can go into other aspects of it. What is very interesting to me is that the occasion for the revolution of 1871 was produced by a crisis, crisis of war crisis of the defeat of France. Um, and that vacuum which was created by the withdrawal of the government from Versailles, from Paris to Versailles, the collapse of the army, which was replaced by the National Guard, which had been paid for actually. We can come back to that structure. But what I want to, to emphasize is that it was that crisis which had made the possibility, which opened the possibility. But that crisis was not actually the starting point. Marx quite rightly only talks about that crisis and then goes into you know, the activity of the commune. And only that aspect of the commune which is related to that 
you know, ab abolition of the state and the rise of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I, I, I wanted to emphasize that because that somewhat resembles the, the October the conditions of the October Revolution. And I think on a global scale, it resembles the crisis which made possible the, the, the Chinese Revolution, is the crisis of the Second World War. These great revolutions, there's a chain of great revolutions that come out of that kind of crisis, crisis of bourgeois rule. Um, so this is, um, but, but those things don't come out of some, you know, one, one problem if you, if you only read the Marxist text, without you know uh, putting that uh, text in a context is as if it was some great spontaneous surprise as if suddenly the working class rose what what made the organization of that spontaneity possible is actually the, another sort of question that is related to this text so to take us now from that context, um, I think this very interesting, um, you know, the, the, the underlying crisis that produces revolutions and so on, despite the fact this only lasted 72 days, 72 days still is a considerable amount of time in other French cities, the communes only lasted for some hours. So this is still an achievement of some magnitude, but to come back to the conceptual level, at several points, you've talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, the withering of, away of the state. These are key concepts in the text. I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about the term dictatorship of the proletariat. The way you've talked about it as related somehow to the withering away of the state. Lots of people think of the dictatorship of the proletariat as the hardening of the state, not its withering away. Could you talk a little bit about these concepts and their relationship to each other? You see, um, one way of looking at it would be that, you know, um, Lenin's great text, I mean, uh, the 18th Brumaire and uh, the Paris Commune and the uh, Lenin's State and Revolution are the central texts of Marxist theory of the state and of revolution. Um, by the way, this title, the, the uh, State and Revolution, uh, Lenin might have uh, taken it from one of the communards who wrote a book called State and Revolution. Um, <clears throat> so that may also be a connection. Even the title may be a connection to the commune. Um, in, the, in the State and Revolution, again, uh, which itself is by and large, in very large measure, uh, a, a summary and a time, in a certain sense, a synthesis of Marx's and uh, Engels's writing, and um, uh, precisely the text that we have been talking about. Again, there again, what Lenin says there is that there is no reason why we cannot distribute the functions of the state among about 200 million people. That's the dictatorship of proletariat. And the, the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat, I think is fundamentally connected with the idea that what, what they call the liberal state, the democratic state, is actually a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie that the liberal democratic state is a, is a political form of the dictatorship of the, of, the, of the bourgeoisie. And that the, when the proletariat smashes the state, the proletariat cannot take hold of the state, it has to smash the state. And it cannot then reconstitute a state in the form of the 
state of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Dictatorship of the, of the, the proletariat is, refers to the shift of power, class power from the bourgeoisie to the proletariat. And which is to say from a minority to a great majority. And the great majority, when it takes hold of the state, distributes the functions of the state among the class as a whole. It has no separate bureaucracy, it has no separate, it is not a, a state of the minority. Therefore, it cannot, it does not create a state other, other than itself. The class itself is, uh, becomes the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, as a whole. And the question is what kind of forms you will have. After all, when you, when the Soviets were, were uh, formed in the, in the Soviet Union, Soviet is, the Soviet is the Russian word for commune. The hope was that that is the form, the, the, the rule, so-called, the political, uh, the political uh, expression of the revolution would take. Um, why did not take that form finally? Um, is, it, is, it, is a different question, but which will take us away from, uh, from the text that we are uh, looking at. Um, <clears throat> so, um, that, and, and that's why I, I began where I began. That at the heart of, of, of Marxism, is the, is the distribution of this, that this concentration of power that takes place under the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the power in the hands of the state, the, the repressive apparatuses of the army, the police, the judiciary, this, that, and the other, which are completely independent of the, of the population at large, um, <clears throat> um, even the parliamentary, form that they, they have. Um, this is what needs to be dispersed among the, the class as a whole. Um, and therefore, the building of the state and the dictatorship, the bourgeoisie, are identical. See, the, the interesting thing about this text also, uh, apart from all these other concepts, is that, uh, as you said, um, it shapes Lenin's writings. He begins to take notes when he's coming into um, the new post-Tsarist, uh, you know, uh, government of Kerensky is in power and Lenin is coming into this hothouse environment and he's taken all these notes and he's left them in, in Finland. Uh, he eventually gets his notes back, starts to draft state and revolution while the Soviets are being created and so on. It's quite an extraordinary text because it goes through the pressy of many of the important texts on the state, including Engels' uh, text on the origin of the family and right. you know, on the state and so on. So um, just to have a few words on Lenin's text, I know we've talked about Lenin already, but just a few words. There's something in both the Civil War in France lectures and then in Lenin's text about the capacity, the belief in the capacity of the proletariat to govern. I wonder if you could say a few things about this, because this is a, an idea that has, has almost disappeared. This idea that, you know, as, as they used to say, I'm not even sure if this is an actual quotation, but they used to say every cook can govern, you know, uh, that sort of phrase. Can we talk a little bit about this belief in the capacity of people to govern themselves and not have to be governed by a class that dominates them? Yes, but that I think should take us into what made the commune possible. Um, you see, uh, as I said, you know, Marx quite rightly be begins with the beginning of the crisis that produce, produced the commune. But that is not the starting point in actual historical fact. The actual historical fact is that 
Sometime in 1868, that is to say three years about, the commune actually came into being. Uh, there arose, despite the, you had the empire, uh, Louis uh, Napoleon's empire, which was a very strict dictatorship. And there were very strict um, forms of censorship. Uh, for the first time in 1868, there occurs what is called a reunion, which is a public meeting, which is not authorized and which does not announce itself as a political meeting in which the survivors of 1848 and young workers of France and a number of emigre workers come together to discuss politics. But what can they discuss? They cannot discuss contemporary politics. They cannot discuss the emperor and his state, and this and that and so on. So they do two things. One is that there is an immediate objective, which is to raise the, uh, sal the, the, uh, the salaries, the wages of women workers in a number of uh, factories. But because they cannot discuss day-to-day -day politics, they discuss high matters. About, the, the, about, and they take the name, the commune in France because there was a commune in 1789. So actually this, this you know, Mark, Mark says on that morning, Paris rose to this. For two years since 69, all such meetings were beginning with Viva la Commune and ending with Viva la Commune. So this conception of what the Commune would look like was developed in those clubs, in those reunion centers, uh, which were which grew all over Paris. And therefore there was a, and then they became networks. And there were itinerant uh, sort of um, uh, members of this, these clubs who go, who would go from one club to the other, to the other. And so a unity of discussion of that time, of that time. And they, they actually talked about everything that they finally did. This was a real process of working class, thinking at a very high level, making a political breakthrough on its own, just what form it will take. You know, um, all the details, everything that was done had already been worked out. The National Guard itself had been organized in these kinds of groupings, which brought the whole of the National Guard together. Uh, you know, so th this, for example, this women's question, for example, was very big. So that when, um, you know, um, Elizabeth Dmitriev uh, showed up first in Geneva and then in Paris as an emissary of Marx, um, uh, and organized the this the the, the the when the commune rose, she actually organized the great women's um, uh, association, um, which became the largest single organization of the commune. Um, this this was a this was this was something prepared well before the commune actually came into being. So it has been, it had been thought about before putting into action. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that it's the ability of the working class not only to organize itself, organize itself or to rule, 
but to produce theory at the highest form. What I'm also saying is that what, what Marx brings to us is a summation of what the working class had thought on its own. Now, not on its own in that sense. Of course, there had been that kind of thinking going on for in, in, in France for a very long time. Of course, as I said, members of the international were very active. Uh, they were very active in the formation of those clubs and, um, and reunion centers and so on and so forth. They were extremely active in women's organizations. They were very active in the, um, in the artist organizations. Um, by the way, uh, the artist organization, which began with membership of 4,000, it was not artists of high art. It was actually working people who worked on the artistic sides of production. What I'm suggesting is that A, there is a link, a historical link. The working class, when it becomes a ruling class, doesn't, that's not the point zero. There has been a very long history of revolutionary attempts, building revolutionary societies and so on. But in this particular case, I would argue that just as the Bolshevik revolution was prepared by the Bolshevik party under the leadership of Lenin and his comrades who had, who had conducted a very high level of theoretical discourse as well as organized a party that was able to then lead the revolution. Something like that had already happened in the case of the commune. Um, and it was inspired by Marx, it was inspired by Blanqui and so on and so forth. But the actual practical details were worked out among, among the workers themselves in their, you know, three years of preparation. How fascinating. Um, Ajaz, on behalf of News Click and Leftward Books, thanks a lot for joining us, giving us a master class on the Paris Commune and on Marx's civil war in France. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.